thank you guys for joining our live stream service. I want to encourage you, if this is your first time visiting our ministry, we want to connect with you. So go check out our website at onechurch.family and click the button that says connect. We want to make sure that we reach out to you and your family and minister to your every need. Likewise, if you consider yourself a member of our ministry, we want to remind you to give. So click on that button that says give and you'll see all the ways that you can give online or physically as well. And now let's see exactly what's happening at One Church. We are so excited about the transformation that is happening at One Church. We just want to say thank you so much to everyone who has given thus far. And we are believing God to do great things through this transformation. So this is your friendly reminder. Don't forget to give. So you can give online through Secure Give or in-house by marking your gift as The Transformation and dropping it off in the tithe bucket. Coming up Wednesday, July 13th is our leadership rally. If you serve anywhere in our church, you do not want to miss it. There's going to be free food, fun, and fellowship. And Pastor Bob is going to be bringing a word to us that night. Child care will be provided. So again, if you serve anywhere in our church, this night is for you. In January of 2023, we are attending the Passion Conference. It's a conference geared towards young adults ages 18 to 25. Don't worry, adult leaders are encouraged to attend. The cost is $135 plus travel. Pay by September 15th to reserve your spot. If you have any questions, see me after service. So that's exactly what's happening here at One Church. Now let's get ready to worship God. Grab your Bible, stand up, and let's get ready for the message. I mean, we had moments, and I could go on and on, but I don't want to just share my story. There's a point that I'm trying to make. After all of that, it, you know, the, it kind of reminded me, how many of you guys know the story of Elijah, right? He had so many incredible moments. I mean, he finds himself standing at a, at a mountain, right, and calling fire from, from heaven down and smashed, smacked the faces of the prophets of Baal. I mean, it was like victoriously. I mean, he was having an incredible moment, and then later he's hiding in a cave. And I, I, I kind of connected with that because <laughs> I found myself, this little camper like a cave, trying to figure out what in the heck I was going to do next. And so... In that moment or in that cave, the Lord began to do something in me. Today, it's my hope that what God has given me by revelation will also be imparted to you. I believe that what I'm sharing with you today is part of the revelation of the last day church that will cause her to stand victoriously and shine bright for the glory of the Lord. And I believe it's due season for greater revelation in what I'm about to share today to be released. I believe it's due season. So I'm going to start. I have two texts this morning, and, um, and uh, literally, I want you to go with me, all right? Go with me in that little camper, sitting on that table, day in and day out, as the Father laid these things out before me and taught me. And so, prayerfully, Holy Spirit will sit right before you today, and that you would not see me or hear necessarily only my voice, but I pray that today, as the Father has taught me, the Holy Spirit would begin to illuminate the same truth inside of you. There are two scriptures, two text messages that I'm going to focus on, so I'm going to read both. Um, Isaiah chapter 62, verses 1 through 2, and then we're going to turn to Isaiah 54, verses 14, the first part of verse 14. So I'm going to read it to you. For Zion's sake, I will not hold my peace. And for Jerusalem's sake, I will not rest until her imputed righteousness and vindication go forth as brightness and her salvation radiates, radiates, radiates as does a burning torch. And the nations, they will see, they shall see, what? They shall see your righteousness and vindication, your rightness and justice, not your own, but his ascribed to you. And all of the kings shall behold your salvation and glory, and you shall be called by a new name, which the mouth of the Lord shall name. Second text, Isaiah 54, verse 14. 
in righteousness shall thou be established. King James Version. In righteousness shall thou be established. So if you haven't picked up on the clues from the text messages this morning, I'm going to be talking to you about this word called righteousness that many, many, many have not truly grabbed a hold of because it's a big word. We don't really kind of, it's just big and it entails so much. But let's focus on the second text this morning, established in righteousness. The definition, sometimes I, I like to be able to look up definitions that I already know, like words that I already know. For instance, the word established. I know what established means, but I just like it to be illuminated. And so I'll go and I'll just, I'll look up the definition to I truly, truly understand the fullness of established. Because Jesus is saying right here that I shall be established in righteousness. So what is this establishment truly talking about because I want it not to just to be head knowledge but I want it to transform the way that I think you understand and so I position myself that way and sometimes I'll find myself opening up dictionaries with common words that we know just to get a fuller picture and so the definition for established is a settlement in a position accepted or recognized brought about appointed and ordained okay i'm gonna read it again a settlement or being settled not waving to the left or the right not a bit settled in a specific position all right accepted or recognized brought about appointed and ordained so isaiah 54 says in righteousness you shall be established so basically what that word is saying is that righteousness is going to become or has become your settled position. Your righteousness is your settled position. Righteousness is your recognized position. And so I know that as I sat in that sort of quote unquote cave, so to speak, the Lord began to teach me about righteousness that I had no clue about. I began to understand righteousness was not based on my victories or my defeats on this side of eternity whatsoever. It was based, righteousness was based on which is 100% eternal, unmovable, unshakable, and lasting. And the Lord began to unpackage this thing called righteousness. It, it, knowing that it was settled but here is there was a great dilemma on the inside of me the dilemma was okay lord i see you're saying that i'm established in righteousness but why is it that i feel and see all that i see around me all that i see on the inside of me i fear <laughs> i look up i see failure i look within i see failure i see fear I see guilt, I see weakness, I see lack, on and on and on. But you're saying that I'm established in something that is not necessarily what I'm seeing. I need you to show me, I need you, because right now I'm in, I'm in quicksand. Anybody ever felt like you look up and you look down and you look within and you feel like, Lord, I'm a sinking ship. <laughs> I'm standing on quicksand. And every time I try to move out, I just get lower and lower and lower, right? I've, and that's where I was. But the Lord was beginning to show me that, no way, there's an establishment that I need to show you. So slowly as the months continued, I sat as a student before my father. And he began to reveal to me the beautiful truth about everything that my salvation was entailed, entailed. And my life was transformed, and I can say that I was almost born again, again. <laughs> you ever heard of that? I was born again, again. I later discovered, though, I wasn't alone. And as the years have gone by, it's like I see it. It's like it's, it's a highlight on, on people. Because I, I later discovered that very, very few people have any faith in their righteousness in Christ. 
I've discovered that many still in the body of Christ have more faith in their weakness and more faith in their lack and more faith in whatever they see before them maybe or their failures or even their victories than actual righteousness. Many are still more aware of what they're not rather than what they are. And that is why I believe a revelation of righteousness is so desperately, desperately needed. So let's go ahead and talk a little bit about this righteousness that the word says we're established in. And how many guys know that right, if it's in the word, it don't matter what your emotions are telling you. If it's in the word, this is the fact. Unmovable, unwaving, unshaking, it is eternal truth, fact. So I don't care what your circumstances or anything else have been screaming for your attention. We're about to discover the fact of the word of God. And if my father so, so made sure to put it in the word, then it must be something that we need to grab a hold of. And my father says that we have been established in righteousness. In righteousness. You were established. You're not on sinking sand. So we got to begin to understand what this righteousness is. Because I don't think there is, you know, I wrote this, there is no other word in the Bible or in theology which is less understood and appreciated than this one word called righteousness. But yet, unwrapped within it is the very thing that humanity has craved. Righteousness is the ability to stand in the presence of God without a sense of guilt or condemnation. I'll say it again. Righteousness is the ability to stand in the presence of God without the sense of guilt or condemnation. Righteousness restores to man all that was lost in the fall and a new relationship as a son and a daughter with all its privileges righteousness. Now I'm going to hit a couple of bullet points so that you can kind of get a bigger picture. Actually, I want to pause. I want to read this to you. Romans chapter 10, verses 9 through 11. If you have it in your Bible, please open it. If you have a Bible app, please open it. Let's, in the Passion Translation, let's read this. Verse 9, chapter 10, verse 9, it says this. And what is God's living message? What is God's living message? It is the revelation of faith for salvation, which is the message that we preach. For if you publicly declare with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will experience salvation. The heart that believes in him receives the gift of the righteousness of God. And then the mouth confesses, resulting in salvation. For the scripture encourages us with these words. Everyone who believes in him will never be disappointed. I have one more scripture that I'm going to read, and then I'm going to hit a couple of bullet points for you guys. Romans chapter 5, please turn with me. Verses 1 and 2. How many of you guys are there? All right, good. Verses 1 through 2, Romans 5. Our faith in Jesus, here's this word, transfers, transfers God's righteousness to us, and he now declares us flawless? How many of you guys sit there thinking, I'm flawless before Jesus right now? You probably feel like if for me to even say those words, I'm going to be condemned to hell. Okay, I'm not going to go in that direction. Let's go ahead and hit a couple of bullet points, right? A couple of bullet points about righteousness and what does it mean. It means that our standing is restored. Now, we just read in the word, right? Our faith in Jesus transfers God's righteousness to us. 
and now he declares it's flawless in his eyes. So our faith in Jesus, there's a transformation. So when you surrender your, Lord, your, your life to the, to the Lord Jesus Christ, you were saved. Like you're saying, I have been bought with a price. The Lord Jesus saved me by the blood of Jesus. I am saved. I'm born anew, right? When that moment happened, whether you realize it or not, I know for me, when I got saved, I knew zero. I knew squatch. I didn't understand anything in the word. All I knew was that Jesus saved me. But I didn't, but I didn't understand what salvation fully entailed. I just knew that I'm new. I just knew that... I'm not the same person. I just knew that my heart is different. I just knew that I want to read the word. I just knew that I wanted to pray. I just knew that I wanted to go to church, but I didn't see the full picket package. Do you understand? But you know what? When our faith in Jesus transfers God's righteousness, what does this mean? I mean, uh, to us, what does this mean? Our standing is restored. When you are in the, um, l- let me say this, when you're mindful of your weaknesses, failure, et cetera, it destroys any initiative. The initiative to pray is destroyed. It, it destroy when you have a sin consciousness and not a righteous conscious. The, the, you you always feel like I just need to sit in the back and have other people pray for me because you don't you don't feel like you have access to the Father, right? Um, it is the oldest and most persistent en- enemy of the faith. Sin conscious. It's when I'm gonna say this. When I feel weak, and I feel like I'm sorry, something's going on, and I'm not as confident or whatever, I have to unpeel what's happening on the inside of me because I've I've almost promised you, I almost promised you, it's because there is something the enemy is trying to make me question whose I am, or whose I am, and the minute all of a sudden the Lord, Holy Spirit reminds me, hold on, Tasha. Let me tell you, you're my daughter, right? You're not worthy because of good works. You're not worthy because of victories. You're not worthy because of anything else, but you're my daughter. All of a sudden, when that happens, my standing is secure again. The enemy and the most persistent enemy of faith is this sin consciousness, and Satan is always after the church to make you question whose you are. Because he knows if you can begin to question who, who you are, whose you are, then you know what? You won't have faith to continue to fight the good fight of faith. You won't have faith to continue to knock. As the Lord says, I want you to knock and you will receive. You won't have faith to keep on running and, and pushing through. You will no longer be a threat to the enemy. Because why? You stop believing. I'm telling you, as men and women... As the church, Lord Jesus, give us full clarity and understanding of who we are in you, Jesus. Because I believe that that revelation, you'll be willing to, (laughs) there's a a saying, I think Pastor Bobby used to say it, um, storm the gates of hell with a pistol gun, or a water gun, a water gun. I'm telling you, when you know (laughs) all of heaven is behind you. When you know that your father is for you and not against you, you say, what mountain stands before me? I got whatever I need is at my, uh, to my right, to my left, is behind me. Why? Because it's the truth. And you know what? The enemy knows that. And when the minute you begin to question it, you begin to back up. So we got to understand who this thing called righteousness Righteousness, again, means the ability to stand in the presence of God. The other thing about righteousness is that our fellowship is restored. Righteousness restores to man his lost lost fellowship with the Father. And we can see this illustrated in Jesus' life. He approached the Father with the same liberty and freedom as a child approaches a parent. And there was no sense of guilt or sense of sin, sense of condemnation in Jesus' spirit at all. And the Lord expects you to have that same posture before the Father as well, because he's made a way for every one of us. And we bring glory to his name when we trust and believe what his word says, and that he's made every means possible. He's made the way possible for us to access him. 
And so we do it in injustice to his word and to, the, to Jesus and the crucifixion when we allow the enemy to lie, this lie in our thinking. And it, it, do you understand what I'm talking about? I'm telling you right now that, you know what, our fellowship is restored, but sin consciousness, or you being more mindful of your weaknesses and all of those things will rob your fellowship and communion with the Father. You ever wondered, you know, like I see some people just, just have a hard time even praying and reading their Bibles, and it's not that they're not saved, they love Jesus, but they just feel so unworthy. They just feel like I've messed up too much to be truly, fully forgiven. But the minute I see, I see this happen so many times, the minute someone's eyes are open to say, wait a minute, wait a minute, I see all of a sudden they'll be at prayer meetings, they'll be, I want to I understand this word. They'll, they'll know, they'll have this passion and this pursuit on the inside of them. And I know because they begin to see who they are. Our faith is restored, and Jesus had no sense of lack of faith. He believed in himself, he believed in his mission, he believed in his Father. Righteousness restores quietness and rest. Rest. I'm not talking about necessarily a physical rest, but rest of your, of your soul, your conscious. It's not constantly beating you up. Righteousness restores that rest. Righteousness also restores freedom. Let me say this, because I've experienced it. The greatest freedom is not political freedom. And the greatest freedom is not financial worry or freedom from financial worry or physical discomfort. And I've had <laughs> a lot of that. It's not. You know what the greatest freedom is? Freedom from being uh, sin conscious. When you know who you are, it don't matter if you were in poverty or in riches or sickness and in death. When you know who you are, uh, there, that is the greatest freedom. You can't, you can't, you can't chain that down. It don't, circumstances won't change that. You can walk through, you know, the Bible says, even though I'll walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. Why? Because there is freedom on the inside. It doesn't matter what's on the outside of you. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow, I will fear no evil. Why? Because the victory resides on the inside of you. It resides on the inside of you. So yes, you will have the courage to face every situation that comes against you, no matter how big or dirty or whatever that case may be. And you will have what it takes because there is freedom on the inside of you to be able to walk it out. As long as that circumstance doesn't get on the inside of you, you'll have victory. My father is the greatest of all. His righteousness, he did it. He made a way for sonship to be restored. And he gives us this sweet consciousness of sonship privileges. We are not a slave. We are sons. We are daughters. And Jesus has made a way. He's made a way. So the question is, because it's, it's hard. It's, I mean, I literally, when I say months of doing nothing else but studying and understanding this thing called righteousness, and I still feel like, Lord, give me more, give me more. It's months, years ago, months. There's, it, it comes by revelation. But I know many of you guys are asking, well, how? How is this possible for all of this stuff to be restored? How can God say, as we read in the, uh, chapter 54 in Isaiah, how can God say in righteousness you shall be established? I'll read you a couple of scriptures. 2 Corinthians 5, 21. For he has made him, Jesus, to be sin for us, who knew no sin, that we might become the righteousness of God. How is it possible? Because Jesus made it possible. Romans chapter 1, verse 17. For in the gospel, a righteousness which God ascribes is revealed, both springing 
from faith leading to faith. Now let me make a statement, and I need, to, I need you to hear me really, really clear. We do not grow in righteousness. We are made righteous. Today, if you know the Lord Jesus as your Savior, you cannot grow anymore in righteousness. You are righteous. You are the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. It was credited to your account. Now, there is growth in the knowledge of what it means. There is growth in faith in our righteousness, but understand this. It is 100% done. 100%. No shaking. It is 100 eternally done. Know whose you are. Know who you are. Romans chapter 3, verse 22 says, Namely, the righteousness of God which comes by believing with personal trust and confidence, reliance on Jesus Christ the Messiah, and is meant for all who believe. Okay, I'm going to read it again because I know sometimes we check out when just, I need you to focus in, right? Very, very important. Romans chapter 3, verse 22, it says, Namely, the righteousness of God which comes by believing with personal trust and confident reliance on Jesus Christ and is meant for all who believe. There is no distinction. Black, white, Indian, Mexican, poor, rich, been in church, raised in church, raised somewhere else. All who believe, there is no distinction. This has been credited to you. Now, I need to shift a little bit. Are y'all following me so far? All right, very good. So there, I, I didn't focus on the first scripture of the text that I started out with in the beginning. We've only focused on the second, which was Isaiah 54. Now I want to go back to the, the first text that I read this morning in Isaiah chapter 62. <laughs> this is so good. Oh, dear Lord Jesus, this is so good. Okay, I'm going to read it again. Y'all ready? For Zion's sake, I will not hold my peace, and for Jerusalem's sake, I will not rest until her imputed righteousness. Now we're understanding a little bit more about this scripture. Until her imputed righteousness and vindication go forth as the brightness, and her salvation radiates as vindication, not your own, but his that is ascribed to you, and all the kings shall behold your salvation and glory, and you shall be called by a new name, which the mouth of the Lord shall name. So, I don't know if you caught this, but it says this, I will not rest until. Did you catch that part? Now, let me ask you a question. If you were to say that to somebody else, I will not rest until, dot, 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 what are you actually saying? Um, if you're correcting your kids, I will not rest until I know that this behavior is addressed in your life. Or I will not rest until. How many of you guys have ever used that phrase? How many of you guys have ever heard someone use that phrase? All right, very good. I will not. So what are you saying? I will not rest until. You're saying it's my priority. It's my priority. It's the, one of the first things on the list that I am determined to see through. So when we read Isaiah 62, it says, I will not rest until. Basically, God is saying... Or I would believe God is saying that righteousness is my priority. Righteousness being imputed, that imputed is my priority. So, hold on. Follow me, follow me, follow me, right? I will not rest until her, our righteousness goes forth as brightness. And her salvation radiates as does a burning torch. I will not, God is saying, I will not rest until your salvation and righteousness goes forth as a burning torch. 
I believe that we become the torch of God in the last days, burning on the inside of us, this righteousness going forth. I'm telling I truly, truly believe that this message, Lord Jesus, would you anoint our eyes with ourselves today, Lord God, that we would be able to see, Lord God, exactly the full picture and help us to fully realize, Lord God, exactly what you've been uh, saying from the very, very beginning. Righteousness having had its full work being fully realized, I believe is what will cause the church to go forth as brightness, radiating as a burning torch, fully realized. Romans chapter 1, verse 17, this gospel unveils a continual revelation of God's righteousness, a perfect righteousness given to us when we believe. And check this part out. There's some things that start happening as you begin to fully realize it. It moves us from receiving life through faith to the power of living by faith. So the part you receive, and it continues to, you continue to receive it until you actually begin to live it. That message of righteousness, you receive it. It produces life on the inside of you, and it continues and continues day in and day out until you begin to live it. So there is, do you all see the picture? It's in the word. As you receive it, you are transformed into what you believe is being displayed in your life. You become that burning torch. You become that burning torch. In righteousness, you shall be established. In weakness, you, be sh you shall be established? No. In failure? No. In righteousness. Romans chapter 4, last scripture, and then we'll be closing. Romans chapter 4 says this. Even King David himself speaks to us regarding the complete wholeness that comes inside a person when God's powerful declaration of righteousness is heard, heard over our life. Apart from our works, God is, God's work is enough. Here's what David says. What happy fulfillment is ahead for those whose rebellion has been forgiven and whose sins are covered by the blood. What happy process comes to them when they hear the Lord speak over them. I will never hold your sins against you. I will never hold your sins against you. Now here's a declaration of truth for you guys. No one has a better righteousness than we have. No one has a better Savior than we have. No one has better eternal life than we have. No one has a better standing with the Father than we have. No one can get closer to the Father than we can. We are what he says we are. We are in the beloved. We are the righteousness of God in Christ. We are the Father's own dream. This is who we are, church. This is who you are. Today, there, I believe, are three groups of people here sitting in front of me. The first group of people, Holy Spirit has already opened this, this truth to you. And you're walking it out. You have currently daily walking in fellowship and freedom. You have, free, you have freedom to worship. Whether you're alone in your living room or whether you are in a congregation, there is freedom in your life to worship unashamedly. You, there is freedom to seek. There's freedom to pray. There's freedom to approach God the Father with no delay. And yes, I just rhymed unintentionally. There is freedom in your life. There is joy in your step. Every morning you get up and you can't wait to meet with your father. And you are confident because you know he's not going to turn his back on me. He's for me. He's not against me. He celebrates me, actually. He's my greatest cheerleader. He is for me. He's for me. And he's eager to speak to me. He's eager to reveal himself to me. He's not hiding from me. He's not hiding from me, but he is eager. He's waiting on the edge of his seat. Oh, I can't wait to meet with my daughter again this morning. I can't wait to meet with my son again. He is eager, and many of you, some of you are here, and you know this freedom that I speak of, and it's because Holy Spirit has opened your eyes to know that you know who you are, and it's not because you performed well yesterday. 
It's not because you were perfect. It wasn't because you didn't slip up. It wasn't because of anything that you did, but because of the blood of Jesus. He has made you clean and perfect, and no longer do you have to bring that constantly before, oh, Jesus, forgive me, forgive me, forgive me. And I lived there. There was so much shame in my life. I, I, there was so much shame in my life because of my childhood. The things that I saw a child should have never seen. And those images would always be in my head. And I had constant guilt. And I'm like, but when God the Father began to reveal himself to me in this way, freedom began to happen. Some of you guys are in that situation where you're like, I know. I know the Father. He's revealed this revelation to me. And it's faith to faith. I'm growing daily. But he's revealed this for me. And I rejoice with you. But I know that there is a second group of people here today, and you're saved. You've had a moment with the Lord. You came to an altar. You confessed your sins, your shortcomings. You had an encounter of some sort with Jesus where he awakened your, uh, and opened your eyes, whether it was in the secret of your own room or whether it was an assembly like this, you were saved. You, you know that you, you love Jesus, but for whatever reason, you wrestle within you wrestle can God really be for me I feel like a disappointment I, fa I battle within me failure I still feel condemned you know it says that for those that are in Christ Jesus we're free from condemnation but yet you still feel condemned your fellowship with the father is very limited you come to church because you know it's the right thing to do but you just feel distant you pray because you know it's the right thing to do but you just feel oh god are you even there um you're the one that you know the thought of ever praying for somebody <laughs> Like, oh, no, 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 not me, not me. I'm not going to be praying for nobody. I need the prayer. I need the prayer. I need people to pray for me. And you, get, you have this warfare on the inside of you today. Oh, God, my heart goes out to you. And my prayer today for you is that the Lord would open up your eyes and give you eyes to see how beautiful and amazing you are. If you're a, a man in this house, maybe not so beautiful, but mighty and strong and whatever those adjectives are, you, you get the picture, right? And today, my prayer is that you would ask the Lord, can you begin to show me fully what this entails? What's the full picture of my salvation? It's not that you just saved me from hell. And sometimes we, we feel that way. Lord, you just, you, I was so bad, but whew, thank God you saved me. I don't have to go to hell. <laughs> right? But oh, it's so much more than that. It's so much more than that. And today I pray that you would begin to see, oh, the, the, the more. And then lastly, there's a group of people in here that you've never, never surrendered to the Lord. You may know religion, but it's not life to you. It's death to you. <laughs> and today, just know that if you've never surrendered your life to the Lord, that today you're here to hear this message because he loves you. And he wants you to know the love that he has for you. But you can only truly understand that by confessing your sin, knowing that no matter what you do, no matter how good of a person you are, it's never going to be good enough. And today I pray that you would surrender to him, that he can reveal himself to you. So I want you to go ahead and stand up for me. I'm going to ask the elders to come up this morning. God is so good. He's made a way where there was never a way possible. 
he made a way for us to become sons and daughters. And today, I'm going to ask you boldly that you would not leave here today if you fell in one of those, you know, where in the second category or the third, that you would not leave here today without asking one of these amazing, beautiful uh, leaders of the Lord, uh, you know, those that have stood the test of time to pray for you. And here's what I'm believing. They're going to lay hands on you today. And if you are asking God, I need to see clearly. I need to see who I am. I need to see whose I am. I need to understand this thing called righteousness. That I'm asking that you would ask them to pray for you that way. And my expectation is that it is God's will and desire that you see. It is not something that we're not, you know, when we know, when we pray, we know he hears us when we pray according to his will. It is God's will that you know all that his salvation entails. And so when you come up here because you've maybe not understood righteousness completely, I know, I know, I know my father is standing here. It's not just the elders, but my father is standing up here ready for you to be able to receive and be under, understand who he has called you to be. And also, if you are here and you've never given your heart over to the Lord, come up. Let them pray for you. You won't regret it. Amen? So let's go ahead and pray. Father, I thank you, Lord, for your word. Your word that, Lord God, is unmoving, unshaking. It is every eternal, God. And I thank you that your word is a double-edged sword. And it pierces, Lord God, the deepest parts of who we are. Father, I thank you, Lord God, that even as I spoke today, Lord God, you were writing, Father, and speaking a clear-cut whisper on the inside of every one of our hearts today, God. I pray for your faith, God. I pray for courage, God, to rise up on the inside of your church, God, over every single person, God, that says, you know what, I heard the voice of the Lord, and I will respond. Father, I'm asking you, Jesus, that you would begin to open up the eyes of us, every single one of us, God, that we can begin to see, Father, and know know who you've called us to be, Father. I thank you, Lord God. I pray for salvation, Jesus, for those that don't know you, Lord God. Lord, I thank you, Father. Lord, have your way. Have your way. Meet every person where they're at today. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. We're going to go ahead. Wow, what an amazing message that was. I sure hope it ministered to you the same way it ministered to me. If you need any specific prayer requests, I want to encourage you, comment right here or message us on Facebook as well. We want to make sure we're praying for your heartfelt need. Likewise, again, I want to remind you, if you're a member of our ministry, don't forget to give. Go check out our website at onechurch.family and click on that give button. See you guys next week.